you're a first time kitchen knife buyer and you want quality, or you're finally looking to upgrade your set to something that will last, we're going to show you how to pick the perfect kitchen knife set for you. Let's get into it. Hey everyone, I'm David C. Anderson coming at you from the Knife Center. Welcome to this Kitchen Knife Buyer's Guide. And rule number one essentially is don't be enticed by those you know, 17 piece kitchen knife sets that you could get for like $100 at the big box store. That's not what you wanna focus on for a couple reasons. One thing, the average cost per piece when you divide it out is gonna be extremely low and it takes a little more investment to buy something that's actually going to last. And the other problem with sets like those is you're actually spending money on knives you don't necessarily need when really three to five knives is all you need to do 99.9% .9 of the stuff that a home cook is going to need to do. We actually like to recommend buying pieces individually and building your own set, whether you're sticking with one brand for consistency or mixing and matching based on what you like. The advantage here is you can spend a little bit more money on fewer knives that get the job done. And a good rule of thumb, maybe look to spend when you average it out across your quote unquote set, something like 25 to $35 per piece is a good range. And if you're trying to hit that kind of minimum level of good quality, there's a few brands you can look at to keep you in that range. One is Victorinox with their Fibrox line or Fibrox handled line of kitchen knives, great stuff. Uh, there's an Italian brand, Duecini, that offers a similar product. These can also be had very reasonably. Uh, and if you're looking for something with more of a kind of traditional riveted handle look, uh, Mercer is another great brand. These are all good ones to consider. And while it's certainly possible to spend more money uh, per piece and get stuff that's even nicer, these are built to last and they're going to get you a certain level of quality that is definitely a step up from those you know crazy high number of pieces for crazy low dollar amount sets that you can get from other places uh, now there's a few things to consider before we get into like those what those three to five knife patterns you should get are a few things to consider and the first is whether you want to go with a western style knife or series of knives or an Eastern or Japanese style of knife setup. Now the Western style of knife represented by this American made uh, Lamson midnight forged chef's knife runs about 150 bucks. They tend to have thicker blades than their Japanese counterparts and thicker edges as well and are known for really being able to stand up to the rigors of professional use. So if you're hard on your implements, that might be a good way to go. And speaking of more money for even nicer stuff, this Spyderco Bunka Bocho designed by Murray Carter runs about 335 bucks. And this is a good example of a Japanese style kitchen knife. They tend to have thinner blades and more acute edges, and they're really known and appreciated for the precision of their cuts and just the excellent feel as you're slicing through your food. Now, these are, of course, generalizations between the two styles. There's certainly uh, things that kind of bridge the gap a little bit, break the rules a little bit. Plenty of stuff there, but that's another show. Let's talk about blade material or the steel here a little bit. Uh, although carbon steel is certainly an option, I think most home cooks are going to be more satisfied with stainless. Of course, it's easier to maintain. Uh, a few things uh, that come to mind if you see something that's marked with like an X50 and a series of letters or 1.4116 or 4116, good basic stuff. Not going to set the world on fire in terms of high performance, but it's solid, built to last, and you know you're buying something that is at least using some good uh, off the shelf metals right there. For some higher end stuff, VG10 is a common steel. You'll often find that on some Japanese style knives. Sometimes like on this Spyderco knife, it'll feature a clad construction where you've got outer layers of a different steel and a core of a higher performance steel. In this case, it's super blue, but we're getting into really more higher end stuff there. But VG10 is often featured as a core material and you can tell when it's that type of construction with this small line that you can see right behind the edge. What about Damascus steel, you might be asking? Well, this is a Miyabi knife from the Henkels brand. It is a five and a half inch Santoku. It has Damascus cladding while still having a core edge similar to that Spyderco. Now Damascus, modern Damascus at least, is created with 
folded layers of metal, and it's basically just for looks. These days, it doesn't get you a performance boost over other stuff. But often, on these Japanese style knives especially, you will see that core metal being a higher end steel like VG10, or in this case, make sure I get it right, Cryodor CMV60, another high performance steel with a nice tough edge on there. But I mentioned that core material there because it is important to know what you're getting if you're looking at a Damascus bladed knife. So if you're unfamiliar with the materials they're using, might be a better bet to stick with the, uh, the plain steel counterparts. At least then, most of the time you're gonna know what you're getting. Although the Damascus stuff that I am gonna show you here today is all good stuff, no worries there. Last one we'll mention is ceramic, which out of the box comes extremely sharp and the edge, edges do last a good long time, but they are a little more brittle and they are gonna dull eventually. When it comes time to resharpening these, they can be a bit of a bear, which is why for most folks, I tend to not recommend this as a longer term investment. Stick with the, uh, the steel stuff. All right, enough background information. Let's get to the knives. Essentially, there's a ton of choices from brands out there. Every brand I'm gonna show you today, I think is worthwhile for you to look at. So just because I haven't shown you a specific uh, chef knife from this particular brand doesn't mean it's not good. It's a broader overview here. But on that chef knife note, the number one knife you're gonna want in your kitchen is gonna be either a chef knife or a Santoku. The chef knife here from Wusthof, the Wusthof Classic, representing a classic example of the Western style chef knife. And we have a Shun Premier Santoku here for your Japanese style. Either one of these, you don't necessarily need both, but this is gonna be your main workhorse in the kitchen, it does the bulk of your chores, and it's worth spending the most money on to make sure you're getting something that's worthwhile. Those uh, affordable brands we're looking at earlier, like the uh, Victorinox and the Mercer, these might run between 50 and 60 bucks on some of the, the lower end stuff. That's still good, mind you. Other stuff is of course gonna be more expensive. But a typical chef knife is about eight inches long. You can make longer or shorter ones, of course, too. But the primary difference between this and your Japanese style Santoku is the way they rock chop, essentially, or cut. But the Western style here has a bit more belly at the tip, more curve, and it's designed so you can rest that curve on your cutting board and rock down onto what you're cutting. And it can be a very fluid motion when you know what you're doing. But whether you're chopping veggies, mincing herbs, slicing meat, you can do all that sort of stuff. This Wusthof Classic 8-inch Chef runs about 170 bucks, made in Germany. Uh, the other kind of poster boy for that style of knife is Zwilling J.A. Henkels. Uh, this Pro 8-inch Chef's Knife right here runs about $160 right now. Same type of thing. Plenty of belly here, great for rocking motions. I really like what they've done with the bolster on this particular knife. The way you are going to hold a chef's knife like this, you're gonna be pinching right in front of the handle, not doing a death grip on the handle itself, but that balanced position right here. Contrast that to the bolster on the Wusthof, two different ways of doing it. And both of these companies make you know, examples of each style. One thing to note about the full bolster that comes all the way down to the edge, as you sharpen the knife over time, you're eventually gonna to have to grind this down a little bit, because otherwise it is gonna prevent full contact with a cutting board on that rocking chop. It's not something you have to worry about on this particular Henkels. The other frequent option for this is your Santoku style knife, which is typically more along a seven inch size. And you can rock chop, but these are primarily more known for their push cutting abilities. So you're actually lifting the knife off the cutting board when you're doing that kind of mince or chopping motion. A Santoku style knife usually doesn't have a bolster, so you're not gonna have to worry about that longevity issue right there. Now the construction of this knife is different from the Western style. We have a tang that's hidden by the handle, which is packa wood in this case. Side note on that, stuff like packa wood is more stable than your standard wood. So if you like that natural look, but you don't want swelling or cracking over time, packa wood stands up to that better. But you have a narrower tang, you have a thinner blade steel and a shorter blade. So the knife is a little lighter, it's more agile in the hand. A lot of times people with, of shorter stature might gravitate towards this style of knife a little bit more. One other thing you'll notice on this Shun is we have this scalloped edge, sometimes called a Granton edge, not entirely accurately, but sometimes that term is used. The thought behind these is it creates a little less suction and a little less drag when you're cutting through something. It should help food release a little more easily. To what degree that's actually happening 
is debatable, uh, but I wouldn't shy away from a knife whether it did or didn't have that particular feature. It looks cool, it doesn't hurt anything, but not necessarily a must have if you're shopping for this style of knife. So don't let that worry. The next knife you need in the kitchen is a good paring knife. And these can be had uh, as inexpensively as like around the $10 mark with something like the Victorinox series or this Boker Saga, which is a bit more premium. It's about $134. About a three and a half to four inch blade is typical. And it's something that should be comfortable in a few key grips, primarily a reverse grip like so. This is that pairing motion. And this is going to be a knife that's used for pairing, peeling, coring, stuff like that, maybe even some small cuts on a cutting board. But that reverse grip is very important. And that grip where you're choked up on the blade a little bit, so you're using that tip of the knife is also very important. Should be real comfortable in both of those. Not much more to say about this style of knife, really. It's simple, but essential. And the third essential style of knife is a serrated knife or a bread knife. Now, seven to eight inches is a pretty common size for this. I actually recommend if you're okay with it, going with something a little bit larger even. Something about a 10 inch size is great because it allows you to cut even uh, larger homemade loaves of bread, the boules that you might uh, come up with. Seven to eight inch knives can uh, sometimes struggle with those. I also like a particular feature we see on this Henkel's Gourmet 10 inch knife, which runs about $100 right now. And it has a little bit of curve to the edge itself. And that makes it a little easier to make contact with the cutting board because it matches up a little better to the motion of your joints as you're pulling the knife through. Another style of serrated knife that's popular for a similar reason is the offset serrated knife, such as this Messermeister Meridian, comes in about $130. It is shorter, it is in an eight inch size, but the drop to the blade itself can offer some of those similar advantages as a curved edge. Now, the cool thing is these are good for so much more than just bread. Thinking outside the box a little bit, great for stuff like tomatoes and other thin skinned fruits sometimes. Also some thicker stuff like gourds or watermelon or stuff works really well on stuff like this. Offset serrated knives especially work well at sandwiches. There's a lot of other cool things you can do. Even some of the longer ones can even in a pinch pull off a slicing knife duty if you'd like. Now, if you get one of each, if you get a chef or a santoku, a paring knife and a serrated bread knife, most things you are going to need a knife for in the kitchen will be covered with just those three. But there are two more nice to haves I'm going to throw at you just as a as an option for expanding your set a little bit. And the first is a boning knife, something with about an eight inch blade and narrow like this global classic, which runs about $130 right now. This offers a good example of a straight backed boning knife, although there are a few options out there for a trailing point boning knife like this Shun Classic, which is a little bit more expensive, about $140 right now. Now, the cool thing about these knives is they're essentially designed to work around joints, whether you're talking uncooked or cooked protein, the narrow blades are going to work really well for portioning down and it can help you save money if you're buying larger cuts of meat portioning them down yourselves, the boning knife and the knife we're about to look at next together will really help you on that front. In addition to that, these are real useful for removing layers of fat or silver skin from your land based proteins. And for your aqua based proteins that can even pull off some kind of quasi fillet knife duties if you don't need the flexibility that a true fillet knife offers really good for that as well. And it can even work as kind of a substitute for the six inch kitchen utility knife that you see in some knife sets out there when you know, the paring knife is too small, but pulling out your big eight inch chef knife feels like a little bit of overkill. These could also make a good option in those scenarios. The fifth and final knife I really like in my kitchen is a slicing knife. These tend to be a little bit longer. Uh, and there's a couple of uh, distinct varieties. This one right here is a Victorinox uh, rounded tip slicer uh, comes in about $76 right now. It's got a 12 inch blade and it has those Granton edge scallops uh, that we talked about earlier. There's also some of the more pointy tipped varieties. Uh, this Mercer MX3 is actually a kind of hybrid slicer and sushi knife. And we can kind of get into a little bit of that as well. 
Why you might want a slicer? Well, as mentioned, in conjunction with a boning knife, it's great for breaking down larger cuts of meat into more manageable sizes, whether you're cooking it now or freezing it for later. In addition to that, some you know, larger baked goods, cakes especially, can work really well because the advantage of this narrower blade is as you're slicing through, it's gonna create less drag than something like your full chef's knife. So that higher level of efficiency is less destructive on what you're cutting if it is a little more delicate, such as the cakes or such as sushi as well. And even if you don't get something like this Mercer that is an intentional hybrid with a sushi style knife, the Narrower, pointy-tipped slicers can pull off stuff like that in a pinch, too. Price on this particular Mercer is a bit more up there. It's about $190. It has a laminated blade with that high-performance core steel, but there's plenty of stuff far more affordable than, uh, than either of these two slicers we did just look at. Those five knives are, are gonna cover so many bases, but I do have one more bonus tool for you, and that's a good set of kitchen shears. I really like something personally that is forged, like this Wusthof Icon set right here. It's about 55 bucks. Great for things like spatchcocking chickens. It can cut through smaller bones, cutting through string. A lot less uh, strenuous on it, but if you're wrapping up a roast with butcher's twine, easy to snip. And other stuff that might be hard to cut with a chef knife on a cutting board. I use uh, a set like this at home all the time, cutting up dried mushrooms into a soup or other stocks and sauces that I'm making. Great for stuff like that too. But really, even if you're uh, averaging your spend out to about 30 bucks per piece or you're spending sky is the limit or anywhere in between, those five knives plus the kitchen shears might be the only kitchen knives you ever need. And with proper care, they're gonna last a lifetime. On that note of proper care, maybe this should be rule number one. Do not put your knives in your dishwasher, please. There is no amount of money you can spend that is gonna buy you a knife good enough that it's not gonna be eventually ruined by running through the dishwasher. It's a harsh environment. Always hand wash your knives. Don't let them sit in pools of water too long. Dry them off when you're done and put them away. That's what we talk about when we say proper care and should last a lifetime if you're taking care of it like so. So rounding out the last few points I wanna make about care and storage, is one more tool, and that is the sharpening steel or the honing steel. Not something that actually sharpens a blade. This will actually just help realign the edge over time as it kind of takes on rolls as you've used it. You can certainly buy one of these if you wish, but I find that most home cooks tend to not use this very effectively. It's got a little bit of a more of a learning curve if you wanna actually properly maintain your edges, there's a few tools I recommend. I'll just kinda of touch on them real quick. Uh, the first is this WorkSharp ceramic honing rod. Looks similar, but it actually is designed to be used with the base planted on your counter. You've got some angle guides here. There's an extra little sharpening trick up its sleeve here. Good tool to use, a little bit easier to use and safer to use than the, you know, holding it in the air. And for all of these tools, we're gonna have some links in the description that will take you to our how-tos on how to use them effectively. But just touching on it here, this is about $30 for this uh, WorkSharp unit right now, and it is pretty effective. Now, if you want to use an electric-based sharpener, which I don't recommend for all folks, it's definitely something that requires practice if you don't want to ruin your knives in a hurry, but I also like to recommend WorkSharp here with their abrasive belt-based systems. Uh, their kitchen versions of these start around uh, the $50 mark and go up from there. They are highly effective when used properly, but practice on your cheap knives you don't care about as much to get the hang of them first because it can remove a lot of metal real quickly if you're not careful. The thing I really like to recommend for most folks, not just for their kitchen knives, but for any of the knives you might have laying around, is the Spyderco Sharp Maker. It comes in about $89 right now. And it's real simple to use. You only have to be able to hold the knife straight up and down. It's got a couple of different types of stones, and I think the white stones on here can even take the place of your honing steel in most scenarios. Again, to learn how to use this system fully, check out the links in the description to our how-to videos on them. But at the end of the day, the great thing about this sharp maker especially is even with minimal skill, you can get a hair shaving edge on most knives that you own. So lastly, storage. Now you may have a knife block that has some extra slots in it that you can fit these pieces as you uh, upgrade. And that's the advantage, whether you're starting from scratch like this or upgrading, 
You can do it piecemeal, kind of grow things over time. And if you find you want one uh, specific type of extra piece that's not covered here, great. You'll be able to add exactly what you need, but you do have to store it somewhere. One thing to keep in mind, if you're using a slotted knife block, whether a countertop model or your, uh, your in drawer style of organizer, they're certainly convenient, but they are a lot harder to keep clean, especially if any gunk gets inside of those slots. Another option is the bristle style of knife block. It's a bit more modular, you're not locked in to the slot sizes, and it is a little bit easier to clean uh, than your standard block. But if you've got space for it, I highly recommend a knife magnet. This model from Henkels is about $30 right now, and even more so than this with its exposed magnets, I even greatly prefer a wood-faced model. It's easier to keep clean, for one, easier than any of these other uh, two, three options that we've looked at. And if you come in at a little bit of the wrong angle when you're putting the knife up, the wood-faced model is less likely to ding your edge. It's possible on these particular uh, magnet exposed models, but they're gonna work really well. Either style is gonna be easier to clean and you get to look at your knives too. Great display option at the same time. So I hope I've been able to help you. I uh, hope I've been able to help you figure out how you can best spend your money. You don't need a lot to have a really great set of kitchen knives. You don't need to spend a lot either. Just don't spend it on those, uh, those big sets. Spend it selectively on quality, on stuff that's built to last. If you wanna get your hands on any of these knives right here and check out the, uh, the other stuff any of these brands have to offer, check out the links in the description of this video. That'll take you to knifecenter.com. If you're new to us, we've also got our Knife Rewards program. When you place an order on one of these knives, you're gonna earn some free money to spend on a future one. That's always nice. But I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center. Thanks for sticking around. Happy cooking, everyone.